praise the Lord. I forgot to turn the microphone on. And I was just talking, but thank you for joining our Webster tonight. God bless you. Thank you, my brother. Uh, truly, God is good. His mercy endures forever. Let us go into a word of prayer at this moment. Uh, Lord God, I thank you for your presence tonight, oh God. I thank you for your goodness and mercy for bringing us through the day, Father God. We thank you, O oh God, that you remove the business of the day from our minds, O oh God, that we have a clear conscience and focus on you. If there be any sins in our heart, O oh God, or iniquity, that you remove it out of us, God, by the blood of the Lamb. I thank you that we have been redeemed from the curse of law, sin, and death, and brought to right standing and right relationship with you through your Son. And tonight, God, I ask that you feed us like a shepherd feeds his flock, to empower, to strengthen, to encourage, to edify, and build us up in our faith, O oh God, to stand on the word of truth with knowing, Father, that this is the confidence we have, we have for you, that we ask anything in your name, O oh God, that you would do. And we thank you, God, that you would, Father, give us revelation, give us insight, give us knowledge, give us wisdom, give us understanding of the word of God, that as we engage this word of God, that it would change our, ch our thinking, change our focus, that we would turn our hearts wholeheartedly towards you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you again for tuning in. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Tonight, we're going to discuss in our lesson on chapter 14 of the battlefield of the mind, a passive mind, a passive mind. And when you think of passive, what comes to mind is a person who is uh, inactive, just sitting on the sideline, letting things pass them by, doing nothing. So they have a passive voice. They're going to have a passive lifestyle where you just let whatever happens just case around what will be will be and that's not the attitude we are to have in christ jesus we are to be productive in our lives in second timothy chapter 1 verse 6 it says wherefore i put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of god which is in in, in thee by the putting on of my hands. And that's the Spirit of God instructing us that we are to be active by working the work of the Word in our hearts to stir up the gift that's the anointing that's inside of you. You have the power to stir up that anointing inside of you to cause you to be productive in the kingdom of God. The enemy wants you to be inactive. He wants you to be in a place where you're not doing anything for God, just living a life that's uh, lackadaisy, a lethargic lifestyle. That means just sluggish, tired, not doing anything to help change your focus, your attitude. And the enemy wants you to get in that type of mindset. No matter what comes our way, he wants us to stand in a place of lackadaisy where we don't do nothing for the kingdom of God, but just let the enemy run rampant in our lives. And that's not the will of God. The dictionary.com defines the word passive as not relating, it's not reacting visibly to something that might be expected to produce manifestations of an emotion or feeling. Not reacting visibly to something that might be expected to produce manifestation of an emotion or feeling. And, and that's what a lot of people are in the mindset where we're just, just letting things pass us by. We're not active. We're not responding to things that we should respond to. So our emotions is just dull. It doesn't care. Like we have a don't care attitude. Second Timothy chapter uh, one, verse six. Chapter Timothy, verse one, verse six. So he says, wherefore, I put thee in remembrance. This is Paul talking to Timothy, his student. He's training him in ministry, and he's giving him instruction that, hey, you got to be in remembrance of the things you learned about, about the, the gospel, about Jesus Christ, that you have to put yourself in, in a place of activity where you got to stir up the gift of God inside of your heart. And he said, which was given to thee by the Spirit, by laying of hands, when the, when the man of God laid his hands on Timothy, he imparted the spirit of the living God, the anointing into his life. And it's up to him to cherish that anointing. That's the same way it is with us today. When you accept Christ Jesus in your life, you receive the anointing because Jesus Christ is the anointed one. 
And when you receive Jesus Christ as the anointed one and you let him become the Lord of your life, that's when things inside of you will begin to activate. Just like a seed. When you plant a seed, the seed doesn't activate until it's rooted and grounded in the soil. So once it's down in the soil, the, the nourishment of the soil begin to feed that seed and cause that seed to begin to sprout root. Then the roots begin to grow because you got to be able to allow the Holy Spirit to activate the gifts and talents inside of you because if you don't allow him to activate you, then guess what? The enemy going to keep you dormant. And that's not the will of God for your life, to keep you in a place of dormancy. You got to get into the word of God and allow the word of God to get inside of you that the word can produce life inside of you. Amen. So, in our book tonight, chapter 14, The Battlefield of the Mind, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. It says this, my people are being destroyed because they don't know me. Since you priests refuse to know me, I refuse to recognize you as my priest, since you have forgotten the laws of your God. And that's in the New Living Translation. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. And in King James, it says it like this. Give me one second. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6. It says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the laws of thy God. I will also forget thy children. And that is a dangerous place to be in the presence of God. When God says you are destroyed because you refuse to study the word of God. You refuse to get the word of God inside of you. You refuse to let the word dwell in your heart. Therefore, he says you are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. For some reason, I'm having a little technical issues tonight. So uh, excuse the, the glitches that are taking place. I noticed it myself. I think it's the internet on this end is messing up. But we're going to continue anyway. You know, as God continues to feed us, let him feed you like a shepherd feeds his flock. And the thing is, a lot of people, they get in the same type of mindset of lackadaisies. They feel just being a Christian is good enough. I don't need to read the Bible. I don't need to pray. I can go to church on Sunday hear a good message, hear some good music, and that's good enough. And I want you to know tonight, that's a lie from the devil. Because if you are a child of God, we are instructed to study the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, 2 Timothy 2.15, we are instructed to study the word of God that we can prove ourselves worthy for God. And the only way you prove yourself worthy to God is by studying his word. 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you got to get in the word of God. You got to study the word of God. You got to meditate on the word of God. You got to dissect the word of God until that word becomes part of your life. So it says here in our book, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. This statement is certainly true concerning the area of passivity. Most Christians are not even familiar with the term, nor do they know how to recognize the symptoms. Passivity is the opposite of activity. Passivity is the opposite of activity. It is a dangerous problem because the word of God clearly teaches that we must be alert, cautious, and active. See 1 Peter 5 and 8. 1 Peter 5 and 8. It says that we are to fan the flame and stir up the gift within us. See 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 6. So 2 1 Peter, let me go to 1 Peter. This is a really good scripture too. 1 Peter 5 and 8. 1 
First Peter, hallelujah, 5 and 8. It says this, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil and the roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So we have an adversary who's always active. He's always productive. Are you productive in your life? Are you studying the word of God? Are you being sober? That means alert, on guard, working, vigilant. For the adversary, the devil as a roaring lion, walked about seeking whom he may devour. He's looking for a, a child of God who is just living their life precariously, don't care how they live their life, don't care what sin they engage in. They don't care about the attitude that they have. They don't care how they mistreat you, how they talk about one another, backbiting, hating on one another. But the Lord wants us to know tonight that you have a choice and a decision that's up to you to make. Either you're going to be sober, vigilant, on guard, alert, or you're going to allow the enemy to run in and out of your life to destroy you. The choice is yours. It's up to you to make the decision that when I get up in the morning, I'm going to seek God first or I'm going to feed my belly. I've read various definitions of the word passivity, and I describe it as a lack of feeling, a lack of desire, general apathy, lukewarmness, laziness. Evil spirits are behind passivity. Evil spirits are behind passivity. The devil knows that inactivity, failure to exercise will, and will spell the believer to an ultimate defeat. This, it will spell the believer to an ultimate defeat. And what I mean by that is that the enemy knows that he can keep you lackadaisy, not being on guard, not doing what you're called to do for the kingdom of God, that this will pull you from your position in the Lord and defeat you. As long as a person is moving against the devil by using his will to resist him, the enemy will not win the war. However, he enters a state of passivity. He is in serious trouble. So when you allow the Spirit of God to use you, the enemy has no choice but to go into a place of passivity in your life. Because now his influences, his tactics, is not going to work on you. Because you're now in a place where you're seeking and standing on God's defense. So many believers are emotionally ruled that an absence of feeling is all that is needed to stop them from doing what they have been taught to do. They praise if they feel like it, give if they feel like it, keep their word if they feel like it, and if they don't feel like it, they don't. A lot of believers are in this type of category because of the choice they make just don't care about nothing. And the enemy knows that if I can keep you in that state of mindset where you have a don't care attitude about the things you should care about, how the life you live before the Lord, the words you allow to come out of your mouth, the, the activity of giving in the, in the body of Christ, sowing seeds, he can keep you in a place of defeat. Empty space is a place. Empty space is a place. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. One of my favorite scriptures, Ephesians 4, 27. Because it says, neither give place to the devil. If it tells you neither give place to the devil, then that means you don't need to open the door for him. Reject him. If he comes knocking at your door, turn a deaf ear. Allow the Holy Spirit inside of you to drive him away. You have a choice. Are you going to accept the enemy in your life or reject him in your life? It's up to you 
to stand on the word of truth and stand in the defense and the shield of the most high against the wiles of the devil. The place we give Satan is often empty space. The place we give Satan is often empty space. You know what that is? The areas in your thought life where you're not productive. The areas in your thought life where God is not speaking to you, you're allowing yourself to ignore the voice of the Lord, to shut out the voice of the Lord, and be driven by your desires of the flesh. That's the area, the empty space he's looking for. The space that's filled with a bunch of stuff that's not of God. And empty, passive mind can be easily filled with all kinds of wrong thoughts. And that's the area he's looking for. When you don't wake up in the morning and put God first, you put everything else first, that's the space he's looking for. We can influence you and entice you and lure you away from the truth. A believer who has a passive mind who does not resist these wrong thoughts, even take them as his own thoughts. That's good. That's a good word right there. Right there, it preached by itself. That a preached by itself. A believer who is who has a passive mind who does not resist these wrong thoughts often take them as his own thoughts. He doesn't realize that the evil spirit has injected them into his mind because there was empty space there to fill. That's why Nehemiah, when he built rebuilt the wall of the city. When, when, he, when he got a word from, from the Lord to rebuild the wall in a city, he said we had to seal the breaches because the breaches were the open pathways for the enemy to come in and out of the city. So if you shut out the breaches, close out the empty spaces, you shut out the enemy from having access to your thought life. So if he wants to inject you with the poisonous thoughts of sin and iniquity, it has no influence or no power over you. So you've got to allow the word of God to get inside of your heart every single day of your life. It's very vital to your Christian growth. Just like a person who injects himself with, with a heroin and they snort cocaine and all this stuff, you're injecting yourself with poisonous toxins that would eventually dull your mindset not only dull your mindset begin to destroy your mindset cause you to lose your mind and eventually lose your life one way to keep wrong thoughts out of your mind is to keep your mind full of right thoughts one way to keep wrong thoughts out of your mind is to keep your mind full of right thoughts what are the right thoughts the word of God. Get into the word of God. Speak the word of God over yourself. Allow the word of God to fill your heart with truth. Ephesians 4, 32, it says, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Right thoughts. That's the right thought to encourage you to walk in love. So you got to get the word of God embedded, injected, just like you inject anything else in your system, no matter which way it comes, we must do the same thing with the word of God. Inject the word of God inside of our hearts and our thought life. So whatever goes into your thought life gets into the heart. When it gets to the heart, it manifests outside of your life. So when people see you, they either going to see you productive or inactive, passive or lazy. It's your choice. The devil can be cast out, but he goes and wanders in dry places for a season. The devil can be cast out of your thought life. But if you don't put anything in there, he's going to go for a season, but he will return with seven more spirits. And your life will be worse than it was in the beginning. When he returns to his old home and finds it empty, 
The Bible says in Luke chapter 24, I mean chapter 11, Luke chapter 11, verse 24 to 26. He comes back and brings others with him and the person's last condition is worse than the first. Isn't that something? How the enemy, he knows exactly when to return. It's like he got a radar on you. And he's, he's tracking your every move. It's like he took one of them drones, the spiritual drones, and they follow you everywhere you go to see when you're vulnerable. And then when he finds you vulnerable, he sends his agents to come in to attack you. And they fill your mindset with all the worldly thoughts, the things that are not of God. And then the state that you were in before become twice as worse. I'm not saying that every person who has an evil thought has an evil spirit. But the evil spirit is often behind an evil thought. An individual can cast down imaginations repeatedly but they will always come back right back until he learns to fill up the empty space with right thinking. That's a powerful statement. An evil spirit often is behind evil thoughts. An individual can cast down imaginations repeatedly, those evil thoughts. But they always come right back until he or she Learn to fill up the empty space in their minds with right thinking, which is the word of God being driven by the Holy Spirit. When the enemy returns, he will then find no place in that person. When you fill your mind up with the truth of God's word, you fill up the empty spaces in your mind and the enemy cannot come into your mindset to attack or lure you away from the truth because you feel that the space he was used to having occupied in your mind. It's like you have an unwanted guest coming to your mind, coming to your mindset, and that person stays long they intended to stay because you allow them to be there. And then when you try to get rid of them, they don't want to leave. Just like you have a guest come to your home and they, they stay long and then you want them to stay and you try to get them to leave, they have all kinds of excuses to keep from leaving. We do the same thing with the enemy when he comes into our thought life. We make excuses. The reason why I'm not living right for God, the reason why I have a weakness in this area, the reason why I keep doing the same, the same thing I've been doing for over 20 years, a bad habit. So we make an excuse to justify our wrongdoings. There are aggressive sins or sins of commission. And there are passive sins which are sins of omission. In other words, there are wrong things that we do and right things that we don't do. For example, a relationship can be destroyed by speaking thoughtless words, but it can also be destroyed by omission of kind words of appreciation that should have been spoken but never were. That's a very good point because we can destroy ourselves but not allowing the Spirit of God to fill us up with himself, with the Word of God. So the enemy, he, he would destroy relationships in the same facet because he knows that, hey, if I can prevent you from speaking kind words to one another in relationship, even uh, appreciation, I can call you neglect from speaking things, and then have you speak the wrong things to destroy one another, to attack one another, to feud a, a, a argument or di, uh, this this what is say uh, dissensions among each other that I can stop you in your track and break up your relationship. There are so many different marriages that are under attack during this pandemic. Even relationships that folks are not married because they're stuck with each other for so long a period of time that they're not used to being around each other this long. So that their, their flesh arises now they're attacking each other. Because I'm tired of looking at you. I'm tired of talking to you. I'm tired of you talking to me. Why do you have to stay home all the time? When the pandemic hit, many people lost their jobs. And not only lost their jobs, but many people lost their relationships because 
of the things that, that enter into their mindsets by being inactive of working. So the enemy does the same thing with our spiritual life. He keeps you inactive become you, till you become aggressive. But you're aggressive against God and you oppose God and you fight against God because you're not studying and not feeding yourself on the word of God. So when you, you lose your, your discipline, you lose your focus, you, you lose your, 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 your drive or inspire or inspiration to do what God wants you to do. So we got to think about how am I living my life? What is driving me? What is holding me back? What am I not doing that I should be doing? Those are questions we need to ask ourselves. Am I being productive in the kingdom of God or am I being non-productive? And with the choice, it's up to you to make a decision every day that, hey, you know what? I'm going to purpose to do something God instructs me to do through his word. I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to pray. I must love on somebody else with the love of God. I'm going to share it with them a kind word. I'm going to do what God instructs me to do by his spirit. A passive person thinks he is doing nothing wrong because he is doing nothing. You need to write that down. A passive person thinks he is doing nothing wrong because he is doing nothing. That's what the enemy does. It's keep you in a place of passivity or inactivity to where you do nothing and you think by doing nothing is okay. So if I have a relationship and I know I should be demonstrating love to my, my mate sometime or another throughout the day, so I don't do nothing. I don't say nothing. I don't embrace them. I don't hold them. I don't show no signs of caring. But I feel it to myself. I'm not doing nothing wrong. I didn't say anything wrong to them. I didn't say anything to hurt their feelings. By you not doing anything, you make things worse because what they're expecting is a reciprocation. If they're the one always demonstrating outpouring love towards you and you don't reciprocate that back to them, you're hurting them. Not only are you hurting them, you're destroying your relationship. Confronted with this error, he will say, I didn't do anything. His analysis is correct. But the behavior is not. The problem arose precisely because he did nothing. So we need to break past this mindset. Allow the Holy Spirit to destroy a passive mindset because a passive mindset will keep you inactive. Keep you inactive. Not only keep you inactive, but it will cause you to destroy yourself. Because the most important thing we need to do every day is seek the Lord while he's able to be found. In other words, when I get up in the morning, thank you, Lord, for blessing me to see another day. That's all God wants. It's your gratitude. He wants your heart. <coughs> Excuse me. He wants you to demonstrate from the love he pours out on us every day by keep on providing us with breath in our bodies, the activity of our limbs, food on our table, clothes on our back, giving us the resources that we need to survive in life. All he wants you to tell him is thank you. And sometimes we get selfish. We don't tell, tell God thank you. We get up, the first thing we do, some, some people turn on the television, what's on the news today. We, we, we won't thank God. We get into the place where we go to the kitchen to feed ourselves, go take care of your own personal high group, high, you know, hygiene, and don't say nothing to God at all throughout the day. Neglect God. And God is watching that because his word tells us that he will render to every man according to the fruit of his doings your reward. So you have to think about what my reward going to be when I stand before God. Is he going to say to me, hey, you well done, my good and faithful servant? Or depart from me, I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. Iniquity is the mindset of being a premeditated person to keep doing wrong. Because you make a choice, I'm going to do wrong. We can make the choice every day to do right by the word of God dwelling in our hearts. 
And the Holy Spirit is going to always lead you in the way of truth and righteousness. But you have to make a decision within yourself. I'm going to follow the Lord all the way to the end of the earth, to the day I leave this earth. I'm going to continue to do the work of the kingdom, proclaiming the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ to someone who don't know the Lord. In our book on page 140, it says, My husband Dave had some problems years ago with passivity. There were certain things that he was active in. He went to work every day, played golf on Saturdays, and watched football on Sunday. Beyond that, it was very hard to motivate him to do anything else. If I need a pitcher honk on the wall, it might take him three or four weeks to get it done. This caused great friction between us. It seemed to me that he did what he wanted to do, and beyond that, he did nothing. I know many people in the same mindset. They do everything else, but do what you need them to do for you. And that's not the attitude of the Lord. The attitude of the Lord is wanting us to get to the place where we put our priorities in order. In this paragraph I just read, his priorities were out of order because the things she needed him to do for their marriage, for the house, he neglected. But the things he wanted to do to please himself was the number one priority. And in our, in our eyes with God, God is looking for us to set our priorities to seek him first. So he has to be the one to take the first place in your life when you get up in the morning, everything else follows behind that. So Dave loved the Lord, and as he sought him about this problem, God directed him to some information about passivity and its dangers. He found that evil spirits were behind his non-action. There were certain areas in which he had no problem because he maintained his will in those areas. But in other areas, he had basically, through non-activity, given his will over to the enemy. You hear what I just said? Some areas, he didn't realize that it was of the enemy. Then other areas were just passive, where he, you know, he just took care of himself first, but everything else, it didn't matter. And so it says it was non-active, and his will was given over to the enemy. And whatever we have to be careful when the Holy Spirit is driving us to do the work of the kingdom. Where's my priorities? Am I getting up, making a decision, a choice to follow the Lord on today? Or am I making a decision, a choice to follow my own desires? He was oppressed in those areas. He had to move into a place where he had no desire, no want no motivation at all to help him accomplish certain tasks. <coughs> Excuse me. Study of the Word of God and prayer were two of the other areas where he was passive. Study of the Word of God and prayer were two areas where he was passive. Since he knew that he was not seeking God for direction, it was hard for me to listen to him. I had a problem with rebellion anyway, and you can see how the devil used our weakness against us every day. Many people are divorced over just such problems. They really don't understand what's, what is wrong. So this is the destructive mechanism the enemy uses in a marriage, in a relationship, to keep you in a place of dormancy where you're inactive, you're just dormant, not doing nothing. And when you don't work at a relationship, eventually it's going to dissolve. Because the most important thing in a relationship is to love each other, to love God, and to work together with each other, to build each other up in the Lord Jesus Christ. If God is not in the picture, then your life is going to be in vain. Because God is the essence of our lives. I was actually too aggressive. I was always running out of head of God in the flesh, doing my own thing, expecting the Lord to bless it. Dave did not do much of anything except wait on God, which severely irritated me. We laugh now when we think of how we both used to be 
but it's not funny then. It was not funny then, and God had not gotten us gotten our attention. We might have been once one of those divorce statistics. We might have been one of those divorce statistics. They would tell me that I was always out of out ahead of, of God, and I would respond by saying that he was 10 miles behind God. I was too aggressive, and Dave was too passive. What a combination. You got one that's too aggressive, and one that's too passive. And that type of relationship is bound to destroy each other. It's bound to destroy the, the relationship altogether, because you cannot function being passive and one being too aggressive. They have to be a balance where we come together, recognize our mistakes, recognize our error and our faults, and allow the Lord to heal and deliver us in those areas that we can begin to build each other up in the Lord Jesus Christ, that the relationship can now grow in the things of God. When a believer is inactive in any area which he has the capability or talent, that particular area begins to atrophy or become immobilized. The longer he does nothing, the less he wants to do anything. One of the best examples is physical exercise. I'm currently a good I'm, I'm currently on a good exercise program, and the more I exercise, the easier it gets. When I first started, it was very hard. It hurt each time I followed the program because I had been inactive and passive concerning exercise for so long, the longer I did nothing, the worse my physical condition became. I was getting weaker and weaker due to non-use of my muscles. They began to see his problem was he was dealing with evil spirits that were oppressing him because of long-term inactivity. We must recognize when we're in a state of passivity, that the enemy is working behind the scene to oppress you, to get you to the place where you are immobilized. You're doing nothing at all but dying. Because the enemy knows that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. So if I can, if I can blind you from knowing who you are and the potential and the talents that God has given you, I can stop you in your track and kill you. That's what the enemy wants to do is destroy your entire life by keeping you in a state of passivity where you're in a mindset where you're doing nothing at all but drifting through life. That's what he wants you to do. Be a drifter. Just drift through life doing whatever pleases the flesh. And that type of mindset it's the mind that the enemy will use to draw you out into a place of the wilderness, a place of dormancy, a place of darkness, a place of inactivity where he can steal your drive. The thing that motivates you for living, the God you serve, that inside of you to pull you from him so he gets you to this type of mindset of inactivity. As the Holy Spirit reveals his truth to him, Dave determined that he would once again be active and aggressive, not lazy or procrastinating. That's another issue, procrastination. Pa procrastination is just as sim sim symbolizes, I'm trying to say, it's just as significant as the word of, of, of being passive because both of these words it's in the mindset of doing nothing. Procrastination means I'll put it off for tomorrow. So if I got a project to do today, or if I got an assignment to complete today, oh, I got time, i do it tomorrow. So you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. You go to work and you be a procrastinator. What's going to happen? You're going to get fired. Because if the employer has put an expectation on you to do something for the company and you get to the place where you're procrastinating about completing the assignment, they're going to call you in the office. They're going to cross-examine you to find out why you didn't complete the, the, the task we're giving to you. And then next thing you know, you get your pink slip. It's time for you to get out of here. Your service is no longer required. 
And that's the thing what the enemy wants to do with God's children. He wants us to get to the place where we procrastinate so much to we procrastinate our destiny into hell. And that's exactly what he does. He kills your desires. He kills your motivation. He kills your God-given drive to live for God, to keep doing what's right, to study the word of God, to live by the word of truth and righteousness until you get to the place where nothing even matters. And all of a sudden, now you're in a place of oppression and depression. You're in a dark place. You're in a place of inactivity. You're in a place where you feel alone, a place you feel abandoned, a place you feel no one cares about you. So now your self-esteem is dropped to the floor. I'm not worthy. I'm not good. No one cares. Why do I even want to live? So guess what? Suicide thoughts into your mind. The enemy plays on your mindset. So you know what? It'd be better off. You're going to kill yourself. Go and take yourself out the world. Nobody going to miss you. Nobody going to care about you anyway. So if you're gone, what's the use? They'll be glad you're gone. Lies from the devil. And that's what the enemy does. He fills our minds in the empty places. He fills our minds up in the empty places with suicidal thoughts. And those thoughts, we play on those thoughts. It's like a broken record playing in your mind over and over and over and over until the event gets into your spirit. Then your spirit begins to act upon it. Now you're thinking of, the, of ways to fulfill the desire of the enemy to kill yourself. Been there, done that. Tried suicide three times in my life, and guess what? I'm still here. Because if God has not deemed for your life to be over and you try to take your life, you're not going anywhere. You may make yourself sick in the process of what you're doing, but God going to heal you. He can deliver you. He can set you free and put you right back on straight street to go right back to the place of doing the work of the kingdom. What he ordained in his plan and his will for your life to be in your life. Making the decision was the easy part. Put it into action was the hardest part. It was hard because each of the areas in which he had been passive now had to be exercised until it was strong again. So the areas of where his gifts and talents were being, being dormant, he had to now exercise to become strong again, to get the desire and that will to run towards God to do what God wanted to do. He began to get up at 5 o'clock a.m. to read the word and pray before he went to work. The battle was on. The devil does not want to give, give up ground that he has gained. And he won't give up without a fight. The devil would not give up the ground that he has gained in your life. There's something to be reminded of. When you give the enemy a foothold, a breach, access into your mindset, he is not going to leave without a fight. Dave would get up to spend time with God and would fall asleep on the couch. Even though there were mornings when he fell asleep, he was still making progress simply because he was getting up out of bed and attempting to build a prayer life. That is so beautiful. That is wonderful. Because when you make a decision and you tell yourself, self Today, you're not going to dominate me anymore. Today, I'm going to give in to the will and desires and the passion of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to let him lead, guide, and direct, counsel, instruct, and build me up in my faith to where I can stand up against the tactics and the schemes and the wiles of the devil. So today, I'm going to give myself to the hand of the Lord, allow the Holy Spirit to have his, 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 uh, his will in my life. There were times when he was bored. There were days when he felt like he wasn't making no progress, that he was not understanding what he was reading anyway, or his prayers were not getting through. But he persisted because the Holy Spirit's revelation about this condition was called passivity. When you have the attitude of passivity, the desire of the devil is for you to quit. 
but the desire of the Holy Spirit is to give you a revelation and understanding of what type of spirit that you're dealing with in your life. And the Holy Spirit will give you wisdom, will give you insight, will give you knowledge, give you understanding on how to decipher and know your enemy and then know how to strategically attack the enemy right where he attacked you and destroy him. We have to have a desire for God's will to be done. Jesus prayed, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because we should desire for his will to be done in our lives as it is being done in heaven. When he went to the garden to pray, before he was being crucified, he said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass from me. What cup? The cup he is about to drink to be die, to die on the cross. The judgment and the punishment he was about to take upon himself for a sinful world. Say, so if it be thy will, let this cup pass to me. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. We're going to pick this up again our next week. The Lord says the same. But that's what you need to pray when you get up in the morning. Lord, let your will be done in my life. That I will walk in obedience to your word. That the word will counsel, guide, and instruct, and direct me in the pathway the plan, the, the, the direction that you have chosen for my life. And when you have that type of desire, God says, when your ways or desires are pleasing the Lord, he will give you the desire of your heart. That's what God would do. Knowing that, he'll make your enemies leave you alone. So we have to get to the place where we pray to seek the Lord daily that his will be done in our lives. So Lord God, I thank you tonight for this lesson. I pray that something has been said or done that will inspire, edify, and build up the people of God in their faith to examine their hearts, to see where in their lives they have been passive or inactive for the kingdom of God. And that you stir them up in their faith, O oh God, to begin to walk in the word, to live by the word, abide in the word of God that the word would transcend, would transform, and change their thinking. They would come out of the mind of the world into the mind of Christ to live the God kind of life, to bring your glory in Jesus' name. Forgive us, God, for our sins of passivity. Forgive us for our wayward thinking. Forgive us, Lord, for the abandonment of the Holy Spirit. Every time he spoke to us, God, we abandon him. But tonight, God, we thank you for the spirit of restoration to flow through our lives from the anointing to destroy every yoke and remove every burden of passivity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. God bless you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior tonight and Lord and Savior, Here's an opportunity to give your life to the Lord. If you're a sinner and you're living a sinful life, the Lord loves you. He gave his life that you would not have to die and go to hell. For the Bible says in St. John chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. He's talking about you. He's talking about me. That you can receive an everlasting relation, eternal life, that's found in accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I want you to pray this prayer with me tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me for my sins, knowingly and unknowingly. Wash me in the blood of the Lamb. Come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you, Lord God, for saving me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God and the Holy Spirit. It's the call of the angels in heaven to rejoice over you because you made that decision to give your life to the Lord. 
Until next week, Lord says the same. We'll resume again at 6 o'clock p.m. Spread the news. Invite others to join us on this uh, Facebook Live. I thank my son for coming on tonight, my friend Rita. God bless you. I thank you, uh, Cousin Joyce. I thank you uh, for Juan coming on tonight, Dorothy, Nashonda Webster. God bless you all for your participation. Eric, thank you, my neighbor, for tuning in. I pray that something has encouraged you tonight to really challenge, you know, challenge yourself. Challenge yourself to get into the Word of God. And allow the Word of God to speak to you by the Spirit of God. And I guarantee that you will find something in your life that needs to change. Because every time I pray, every time I not only pray, but when I study God's Word, there's always something that God reveals to me about myself that needs to change. I love it. I love it so much because being a pastor is not an easy thing. But I also realize that it's only easy when I learn how to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ and the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And every time I do that, that's when things begin to change in my life. And I want you to know tonight that you can change your mindset. You can change your life. You can change your attitude. Everything about you can change when you learn how to submit to the Lord Jesus Christ. Allow him to, to um, uh, impart his revelation into your mindset about yourself. And when you do that, things will begin to manifest and change your life. God bless you tonight. Thank you again. Give me one second. Something I'm about to do here. Uh, okay, let's see here. If you desire to also sow into the ministry, I'm going to post the link on here in just a second. But um, if you decide to sow a seed to this ministry uh, for the material that God gives me to study and to read, to teach, feel free to do so. I'm posting a link on here right now. And I guarantee when you sow in faith and believe God, he's going to restore to you even more back into you because of your faithfulness and your, your obedience to the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we hear God provoking us to do something we should do. Even when it comes to sowing seed, God tells us to sow seed, but we reject him because we allow ourselves to, to, uh, uh, what else, to, uh, to defy God's word. That's what I'm looking for. We defy God's word by not walking in obedience. And I, I, I guarantee you, every time I sow a seed, I get blessed double every time. And that's the, I'm a living witness. Sometimes I get it from church. Sometimes I get checks in the mail. It doesn't matter which avenue it comes. Sometimes people just give it to me because God has told them to do that. And it'll be just what I need at the right time. And I turn around and take those same seeds. I sow it right back into the ministry because that's the most important thing to me is learning and studying God's word to teach his people. I love teaching the word of God. I love encouraging somebody to live to their potential because a lot of times when I live into the full potential, because of lack of knowledge. But when God produced avenues for us to learn, we need to gravitate to those things, to those resources. Take those resources and hold on to the, the teachings and apply it to your heart. And I guarantee when you do that, you gain more knowledge, you gain more understanding, you become more wiser, you become a student of the word of God, and you begin to grow in the callings and the talents and the gifts that God placed in your life. So until next week, you all be blessed, stay encouraged, stay in the Word. If you don't have this book, get this book, The Battlefield of the Mind by Joyce Myers. Get this book. I, I encourage you to get this book. It's so much enriching information in this book that will change your entire life and also change your destiny. So walk by faith and not by sight. And may the peace of God Rest, rule, and abide your heart until we meet again. God bless you. Shalom. Peace be unto you.